So welcome everybody to the uh, Sunday morning at the Nebel Proctor, which is now on Zoom. Uh, this is uh, Institute for Critical Study of Society, which, which was established in early 2000 by a group of activists and intellectuals at the library <laughs> for uh, keeping our focus on Marx, and in my opinion, Marx, Engels, Lenin, so forth, all the revolutionaries work in focus because in particular Marx, but also Engels, their works are fundamental, even if you disagree with other revolutionaries. So those are the fountainhead of our Marxism. So uh, <clears throat> with that, uh, I will not go further. Jean uh, Rule is going to be the speaker today as uh, the topic is socialism in the 21st century. Everybody here knows Jean. Jean is the um, a person who does most of the work or a lot of the work along with others to put this program on. And uh, he's a, a retired professor and writer of many books, um, very committed to socialism and a great activist. Uh, so with that, and he's going to uh, say something about himself. So please welcome uh, Gene Rule. Okay, thank you, Raj. Um, and you left out that I used to make coffee, but um, now you're going to have to make coffee yourself. But I have a cup. Thank you. So it's good. You can say that. <laughs> Pardon? I was letting you say that. <laughs> okay. And, and uh, it's good to see everybody. Um, and you can, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. I'm going to try putting it on full screen, see if that's better. Uh, let me see. View. Slideshow. Is that yes. better or worse? Yes, now it's the full screen. Okay, so we're okay. All right. Well, we can get started, um, I think. Yeah, and as some of you know, today or yesterday was uh, the 200th anniversary of Friedrich uh, Engels' birth. And so we need to take cognizance of that and uh, celebrate it. And both. The what we're saying today and, and next time when uh, Engels was a, a Marxist theorist of war, as you know, as well as peace and ecology and so many other topics. So, um, and let's see. Okay, the program today is going to be based on the Marxian principle that socialism is not a ideal, let's see. Uh, uh, not an ideal to which reality is going to have to conform, but it is an actual movement which is transforming the world and contributing to human progress and well-being. Over the past two centuries, socialism has developed a variety of forms, most of which have survived the defeats of the 20th century. And of these, we will examine the two most promising forms, socialism with Chinese characteristics, of Mao Zedong, Deng Xiaoping, and Xi Jinping, and the socialism in the belly of the beast, um, namely American-style socialism, of Eugene Debs, the New Deal, um, Bernie Sanders, and the Reverend Martin Luther King uh, Jr. And scientific socialism, as you know, began with Marx and Engels and was further developed by Lenin and continues to evolve as a science with the leadership of Stalin, Mao, Deng, and Xi, as well as a host of others, including Fidel, Xi, Ho Chi Minh, and others. And just a disclaimer, um, the topic is not to be confused with the socialism for the 21st century espoused by many on the left, associated with the Bolivarian revolution, which was very important and definitely worthy of discussion, but due to time constraints, we will not be able to discuss it. Um, and uh, we've had a, a very good series of talks in these past few weeks um, with our comrade Wadi from uh, Boston, Rick Sterling, talking about um, uh, 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 
Syria, I believe. And again, this is very good because he did say, mention that uh, uh, Syria is, is, is a socialist country and not maybe in the Marxist-Leninist sense, but in their own sense. We had Stanford Smith do a good job on imperialism, I think, which is, uh, uh, was very informative. And next week we have Raj speaking on uh, Marx's ecology and our friend Grover Fur will be coming in. So um, uh, we have an excellent uh, round roundup. And when this, this session basically opened up, we had a cancellation. So I saw my opportunity and snagged it, which was possibly premature because I'm not as long. I don't have the whole thing worked out as well as I should, but uh, it's gonna be changed soon anyway, as we know, we don't know what those changes are going to be. Um, but I wanna start off with uh, uh, Richard Wolf, who has a um, under three minute talk here. Start here. One of the reasons I have to begin at the beginning in a way with China is because of an effect of the Cold War, that struggle between the United States and the Soviet Union that occupied most of the second half of the 20th century. One of the results, as often happens in wars hot and cold, is that the first casualty, as the slogan goes, is the truth. Uh, war makes people think and say things that aren't true because they hope one side or the other wins and the truth gets lost. And that happened with everything having to do with socialism and communism in the period from roughly 1945 to the end of the century. And for many Americans, for sure, it hasn't stopped yet. Let me give you some examples. Uh, here's one that will be relevant to China, too. That the Soviet Union represented a system that was opposed to private property, that got rid of private property, and that substituted public property or the government's ownership for private ownership. That was a nice story to tell because you could then say, gee, here in the United States, we celebrate and protect private property, whereas in the Soviet Union, they got rid of it. It's a nice story to tell, but it has nothing whatever to do with the truth. The Soviet Union, and this is important because of the education or miseducation, as you would have it, the Soviet Union never got rid of private property. That's simply not the case. Let me be more specific. In the immediate aftermath of the revolution back in 1917, one of the first acts of the new Soviet government was to divide the land, the land, most of Russia was agricultural at the time, taken away from the huge landowners, carved up and given to individual farming families as their, you guessed it, private property. So that was the act of the revolution, to give private property to the mass of rural people. Since they were the vast majority, the following sentence is true. More people gained private property as a result of the revolution than ever had it before. So not only did they not get rid of private property, they expanded it. Okay, let's now go 10 years later, <clears throat> end of the ninth. Okay. Um... Well, this is, that was Richard Wolf. Um, that is his program, which has uh, some 200,000 subscribers. And his book on the Soviet Union with uh, Resnick uh, is, has gone through numerous editions. So he can be considered, I think, a authority on the Soviet Union. But what I did is I um, Uh, took the, another step because I felt a little bit uneasy about this. Okay, um, so what I did is I went to Wikipedia um, and Googled, uh, I think, either Lenin or Decree on Land. And this is what Lenin said about the Russian Revolution and his Decree on Land. Here's what the Decree on Lenin said. Private ownership of land shall be abolished forever 
land shall not be sold, purchased, leased, mortgaged, or otherwise alienated. All land, whether state, crown, monastery, church, factory, uh, entailed, private, public, peasant, etc., shall be confiscated without compensation and become the property of the whole people and pass into the use of all those who um, cultivate it. So um, that's what Lenin had to say on the abolition of uh, private property in the Soviet Union. And if we look at China, they say very much the same thing. Article six of the constitution, um, which is one of several articles, uh, the basis of the socialist economic system of the People's Republic of Property is socialist public ownership of the means of production, namely ownership by the whole people and collective ownership by the working people. Um, the system of socialist public ownership supersedes the system of uh, exploitation of man by man. It applies the principle of from each according to his ability to each according to his work. And then uh, um, he, the constitution continues with uh, in articles seven through 13, describing in much detail there. Um, so I think um, that is somewhat in variance with what uh, we were told by uh, Richard Wolff. And uh, so I wanted to say a little bit more about this. So I'll make, leave you to make up your own judgment about how reliable Wolf's description is, but uh, um, I've never met Richard Wolf, uh, but apparently we're, we were at Yale at the same time in the 1960s. I went to Yale um, in 1963 with a fellowship from that I got from uh, uh, UC Berkeley. I graduated in 1963, went to um, Enrolled in Yale, joined the Yale Socialist Club and the um, New Haven Corps. Um, and uh, this was, uh, again, during the period, and, and um, I went, got there in 1963 uh, in the anthropology department. Wolf arrived in 1964 in the economic department. He did well there, apparently, got his master's and PhD, I think, from um, Yale. Um, they kicked me out in 1964. They were very gentlemanly about it, uh, but they realized that uh, I was not going to be a good Yale product because I was too, was really interested in Marx and the war in Vietnam and how you explain what was going on in Vietnam. <clears throat> and for me, um, it, as I think was generally understood about the war in Vietnam, is this was a war that US imperialism was waging against socialist Vietnam. And it was also generally understood that the United States itself was a racist society and that the American people did not benefit from this war and they did not support the war. In fact, uh, the left at that time was dedicated to ending that war uh, and wars generally. But uh, the situation, in, and I tend to see everything uh, in current world politics in, in these terms. We have uh, two agencies struggling against one another. One may consider them great powers if one wants to, but I think that's a misunderstanding. I think it's best understood as a war that U.S. imperialism is waging against socialism and working people generally. And... Uh, uh, the work, people in the United States do not benefit this from this. They do not. But unfortunately, what's gone on since then, uh, people have started to endorse it. So um, I, I did, um, after I left Yale, they were gentlemen about it and they got me into Columbia, which was a much better school. I got my PhD there and um, got a job at University of Virginia, uh, which was an aspiring, they wanted to be the Southern wing of the Ivy League. Um, and I got into a further disagreement with the Dean uh, of the faculty there who said, so some of my work was rather nice, but um, 
much of it was, as he described it, dull, old-fashioned, doctrinaire, and incredibly naive Marxism. Um, and on that basis, uh, we decided that I should leave and he would stay. So I moved to Cal State Long Beach, which uh, for me was a much better environment and um, got along fine there and had a perfectly decent career with retirement and all that. So uh, that's a little bit about uh, Richard and me and Yale in the 1960s. And again, he's recognized as a, an authority with 2,000 um, people on that. But again, I think uh, I have... Uh, I think our little organization here is doing a much better job because we don't, we have much better view, I think, of what um, um, Soviet Union and, uh, has, has accomplished. So moving along, um, at this point, I want to just uh, kind of talk a little bit about our crisis that we're facing at the contemporary time, you know, with um, not only the economic crisis that we're having, uh, not only with the threats to the environment, uh, nuclear war, uh, the threats of that, um, and add to all that the COVID crisis. So we um, are facing a period of multiple crises, and this brings to mind the words of the Hungarian uh, uh, communist, uh, George Lukács, in 1948, which was a time, again, also a great crisis because 1945, there was the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which it, humanity entered a new phase, but it, uh, that wasn't just the end of World War II. It was the beginning of the Cold War, as we know. And uh, 1946 was um, Churchill's famous uh, Iron Curtain uh, speech and other things. Uh, going on around the world. So in response to this uh, dismal situation, much like today, he said, there is, of course, plenty of darkness around us now, just as there was between the two wars. Those who wish to despair can find cause enough and more in our everyday life. Marxism does not console anyone by playing down the difficulties or minimizing the material and moral darkness, which surrounds us human beings today. The difference is only, but in this only lies a whole world, that Marxism has a grasp of the main lines of human development and recognizes its laws. Those who have arrived at such knowledge know, in spite of all temporary darkness, both whence we have come and where we are going. And those who know this find the world changed in their eyes. They see purposeful development where formerly there was only a blind, senseless confusion surrounding them, where the philosophy of despair weeps for the collapse of a world and the destruction of culture. Their Marxism watch the, their Marxists watch the birth pangs of a new world and assess, assist in the mitigating the pain, pains of labor. And um, again, I think this is well taken. Um, let me just check something here. See how we're doing time-wise and you're keeping track of me, aren't you, Raj? So, um, so the question then becomes is how do we assist in mitigating the pangs of, uh, of the birth pangs? Things are very difficult now, and so what do we do? And earlier I mentioned um, my hard-worn conviction through my uh, trail, uh, travails in academia, that Marx was right in the 19th century, and Lenin was right in the 20th century, and that our task for the 21st century is to do for Marxism-Leninism what Lenin did for Marxism. And that is a pretty big order. I, apparently, I don't know because it's blank there. But um, so I wanted to approach this question. And um, uh, someone told me that Hegel says somewhere, uh, actually in the Phenomenology of the Mind, but uh, I never read that book. 
uh, because I can't read while I'm standing on my head. And as we know, Hegel had the whole world turned upside down. But he said, the truth is the whole. And the way this was explained to me is that the, if you look at an acorn, for example, the whole, that's not the whole truth about that acorn. The truth about that acorn is it's going to develop. It's going, if you plant it in the ground, it will turn into a sapling. It will turn into a, a fairly good sized tree. And if you come back in a hundred years, there'll be a giant oak and you can take that oak and you can chop it down and make a kitchen table out of it. Or maybe the house will burn down and it'll end up as ashes. So that the truth of that acorn is the whole process. It's, it's being, it coming in, it develops and it um, disappears. And much the same can be said of socialism. Um, and according to the Marxism, Marxist-Leninist concept of socialism, it's a phase in the revolutionary transition from capitalism to communism, which is a global process and it goes through certain phases. And let me see here. Yeah, so we have to look at socialism not as an ideal, not as something, oh yeah, that's a cool, cool idea and so forth, as many people do. But instead we need to understand it as going through a series of developments and it's going to continue to go through these developments. Uh, in the 19th century, it was different than in the 20th century. And it was after this empire struck back in 1989 to 93, um, we had, it survived. And we had 21st century socialism up until the present. And it will continue to evolve until in the 22nd century, uh, we'll either have socialism or barbarism but the socialism will be the higher phase of communism by the 20th century. Um, or the whole world may collapse, but we don't like to think about that too much. Um, someone said that it's easier for us to think about the destruction of the world than the end of capitalism, which is probably true. Okay, so if we go back and look at this development real quickly, um, the session, something on socialism and human progress. Um, because uh, I don't know if you know the song by Anne Feeney, um, Have You Been to Jail for Justice? But she uh, says in there, once unions were against the law, but slavery was fine, women were denied the vote and children worked the mines. And um, if we look at socialism, it has transformed all that. Um, Again, unions were against the law in the 1820s when the idea of socialism was first put forth as it developed. Uh, we had see, saw the development of powerful labor unions uh, with the Philadelphia general strike of 1835, which gained the 10 hour day, other kinds of things. Um, the women suffrage movement started in Seneca Falls in 1840 and socialists were very heavily involved in that. The abolition of slavery in the American Civil War, Marx and his followers in New York and elsewhere were heavily involved with uh, the movement uh, to elect Abraham Lincoln. And when Abraham Lincoln was um, uh, elected and the Civil War began, all the um, Marxists, uh, communists in New York and Boston and elsewhere basically disbanded because they all joined the Union Army. Um, and Marx was involved with this also as part of the resistance because the, he was afraid that the English bourgeoisie would want to um, support the South. And so he organized these demonstrations like our current solidarity movements. Um, so we see um, the rise of powerful also political parties again started by Marx, but here in the United States as well, that challenged the capitalist state power. And when we think about what the capitalists, you know, in their period of industrialization, they worked uh, children to death in their satanic mills. Stalin being a brutal dictator that he was, sent them to school, forced them to go to school, forced them to learn how to read and write, not only to drive and build tractors, but also taught them the classics of Russian and world literature, 
Um, and on the first May Day, uh, Ingalls was writing the um, uh, the um, introduction to to the Communist Manifesto, and he said, "Today is our." And he did, was doing this on May Day, uh, in eighteen ninety, and he said, "Basically, you know, um, if uh, now uh, we we have a, uh, the whole working class is organized." and holding a powerful demonstration of its power. And if only if Marx were alive to see this day. So that was, uh, for, this was the first phase of uh, socialism, which I call 19th century socialism. It made real significant progress, real changes. But after the failure to uh, stop the imperialist war of 1914, uh, this period ended with the bloodletting of World War I it said that Rosa Luxemburg and um, um, Claire, Claire uh, Zelkin uh, considered committing suicide. Uh, they were so disillusioned by how could, how could we have done this to, to vote in favor of the war? And uh, Engels, uh, Lenin refused to believe it at first. Like it was just bourgeois propaganda, uh, but soon they recuperated and continued the class struggle. Um, and initiated the second phase, which was the Soviet Union uh, from 1917 to 1991. Uh, first phase was socialism in one country, and then we had socialism in many countries, and the empire striking back. And then, um, but that starts the beginning of uh, the 20th, first century socialism, in which uh, Important members of the Soviet socialist bloc, uh, Cuba, China, Vietnam, Laos, North Korea, they all survived. It was a dramatic shock, but they did. And also other kinds of uh, socialist socialism survived as well. So-called democratic socialism, um, Euro-communism, Western Marxism, the Bolivarian Revolution, the Pink Tide, and so forth. And those all form part of the 21st century socialism. But um, um, I, I, what I want to do is consider two kinds. First is socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era. And the other is uh, what I called is socialism in the belly of the beast, uh, namely the kind of socialism we have here in the United States. And these are, are very significant, I think. Um, first of all, socialism with Chinese characteristics. And I put a long, a lot of material in this, but let me just whip through this real quickly. The, because the question, many people say, no, it's not uh, socialism, it's state capitalism, which is Wolf's view. Um, but the question is not whether China conforms to the idealist and utopian conceptions of Westerners, but does it conform to its own Marxist-Leninist uh, conception of socialism? And as we have seen, um, and this is what I cover uh, in that sec sections of my forthcoming book, China defines itself scientifically. It is the product of a socialist revolution in 1949. And this was led by a party affiliated with Com Lenin's Communist Party with the guidance of Marxism Leninism. And it continued uh, to, to this, the present day Communist Party uh, of China uh, has never broken this, <laughs> this heritage. Uh, the democratic dictatorship of the proletariat. This is part of the uh, Chinese constitution, as it was in the 1918 constitution of the um, Soviet Union. And it also operates according to Stalin's law of socialist development not according to the law of capitalist development where the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Um, uh, socialism increases the social benefit for everyone. Um, may perhaps not all equally, but uh, um, 
it, that, that's the law of, of socialist development. Um, state capitalism, uh, which Mao talks about in saying, well, st state capitalism of a particular kind, a new kind, because it benefits the people. Only, and only about 10% of the uh, profits go to the uh, capitalists. The rest goes to the people. And I have more material on that. And it benefits and supports the Chinese working class and the Chinese people. Uh, New York Times has this section where it says, where they graph this and point out that uh, for uh, the Chinese working class as a whole, uh, their income has increased, um, uh, has quadrupled. And even the poorest Chinese workers have seen their real incomes double in the past 20 years. Whereas here in, in capitalist America, uh, we know our incomes have not increased uh, if we're not part of the 10 or 20% or 1%. Um, and also it supported uh, various statistics. Um, uh, polls that are taken indicate a 90% uh, support by the Chinese people for uh, their government, contrasting with like 38% here in the United States. And socialism will last as um, Lenin said, and Marx agreed on this, that uh, it will last an entire epoch, uh, but it has defects, as we know. Inequality is is pretty is one of those defects. Dealing with the environment, I think I consider the um, consumerism uh, to be a defect. Breaking the iron bo rice bowl is a defect, but that is to be expected as the working class learns to rule as a class and develops its program. And finally, it leads to communism. And that's something that we uh, uh, have a lot of quotes about what Marx was never really, didn't say a lot about communism and the future post-revolutionary society. But what he did say was quite clear. And I have a bunch of quotes in there on that. So there are other questions, I'm sure, but I think these are central. But the point is that both the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China, as well as Cuba, Vietnam, and North Korea conform to this scientific definition, and no other countries do. Uh, I think I'm doing okay time-wise. You have 25 minutes remaining. Okay, yeah, I also try to rush through this. Okay, so that's um, one of the key things that is happening. The other thing is socialism here in the belly of the beasts. Because as you know, uh, Che said that, that I envy you North Americans. It was, I think it's attributed to Che, it's also attributed to other people. But he said, I, I, um, I envy you North Americans for yours is the most important struggle of all. You live in the belly of the beast. And what he meant by that was not, of course, that, well, our struggle for single-payer health care is really important because Cuba has better. Uh, our struggle for free education is not what uh, Che was talking about um, because they have a better educational system there, free. Um, but what he was saying is that you live in the belly of the beast and therefore you have a unique power to deal with the beast. You have the power to overthrow this peace. Other countries may fight against it in one way or the other, but living in the very, very heart of the beast, you can overthrow that beast. And that makes it very significant. And uh, I think if you look at the history of American socialism, um, in the past, it has been overwhelmingly uh, anti-imperialist, and uh, uh, wanting to get rid of American imperialism. So if we look back at Eugene Debs, um, you know, when the German social De and French social democratic parties were endorsing the war, uh, Eugene Debs opposed the war and was sent to prison for that, as we know, and did his uh, very, gave some very important speeches and um, ran for, for president 
as, uh, as a socialist and got close to a million votes. The New Deal, we usually don't think of that as socialist, but it was, uh, um, as actually Eric, uh, Richard Wolff points out in one of his talks, that, that it was a coalition of the Communist Party, the Socialist Party, uh, labor unions, uh, uh, as well as the correct, corrupt democratic machine and, de and the Dixiecrats and FDR that put together this uh, new deal, which did not call itself a socialist, neither did Sweden uh, on, when they put together what's called the middle way, de way. They did not call that socialist, but it has many of the elements of socialism and has to be considered um, in any discussion of socialism, I believe, um, and clarify its exact nature. Bernie-style socialism, again, um, after the war, uh, that continued for a while, but it was gradually undercut by the, um, um, the new labor law, with, um, Taft-Hartley law, and by the McCarthyism particularly, so people developed a phobia against that, um, as Wolf points out. Um, but then, um, uh, but Bernie style socialism then developed and is significant because Bernie got 13 million votes more than any other, not only more than any other president, socialist presidential candidate in US history, but more than all others combined. And this had a tremendous impact on our public consciousness. It led to, you know, uh, he didn't win the nomination, but in 2018, he, he quadrupled, basically the Bernie people did uh, with the so-called squad um, and continues to be a very active uh, movement. And then uh, I think so many people, you know, when we celebrate Martin Luther King Day, it's usually about we see, you know, ROTC groups from black high schools marching and so forth, as we always saw in Long Beach. But we forget the revolution that Martin Luther King was a, considered himself a democratic socialist, but he was also, again, uh, there's a, lot, a couple of essays that I quote very, um, extensively there, where Martin Luther King was saying, yes, I think there has to be a better way of doing things. And maybe it has to be, I don't care what you call it, but maybe it has to be a democratic socialist. He also said that the only way to solve, well, the problems in the ghettos is um, we need to uh, give people a better, th something better. Maybe there has to be a democratic uh, socialist transformation. And you know, in his very famous speech, Beyond Vietnam. He called for the, um, um, revolutionary, um, uh, we need a, a overwhelming uh, uh, revolution of values, a revolution of values in the United States to end poverty and uh, racism and militarism. So he was not only for socialism here at home, but a revolutionary transformation of the global system as well. So he's very much aware of his uh, commitment, not only to end racism here in the United States, but also the international components and if that revolutionary transformation of values uh, was put into effect, then American imperialism uh, would be um, having a much harder time. And that I would suggest is the reason they shot him, um, which they've done to so many of our revolutionary uh, people. So um, I, I, bo both of these topics need much more discussion and I'm be happy to talk more about them. Uh, but uh, I wanted to get through this and there's a, a lot of things that need discussion. But, um, and the other thing is, as we know, um, you know, coming out of uh, being educated during the period of the 60s and the war in Vietnam, um, you know, I take that same 
view um, of what's going on today. It continues to be a war of US imperialism against the socialist world and against the workers of the world. Um, Chinese working class is the um, largest working class in the world. Uh, and uh, we need to seek ways of uh, uniting with them. So to deal with the last question that I wanted to deal with, and we, we talked about this before, but I wanted to weigh in on the topic and let you people uh, discuss it as you will. But anyway, um, what should the working class do? Marx, as you recall, said workers of the world unite. He didn't say workers of England unite. He didn't say workers of Germany unite. He said workers of the world unite. And Lenin, as we know, changed this. He said, well, um, in, in the Soviet Union, um, uh, or in, in Tsarist Russia, workers were not the majority. So they had to unite with other oppressed classes, specifically um, the peasants. And that's where the, the workers, this was not just a worker state they developed, but a workers and peasant states, as Lenin made clear. Um, and this is symbolized by the hammer and the sickle, which has continued to characterize all communist movements to the present day. Um, but also we need a revolutionary theory. Um, and uh, we do have a lot of people who call themselves socialists who present these views. Uh, and I gave uh, Wolf as an example of this, um, that, you know, Wolf has a lot of followers and many people um, think that is the solution, but I have a lot of hesitancy about that. And um, with, with many of the people who call themselves socialists today, you know, I do not, I feel very uneasy about them teaching courses on socialism. Um, in my view, it's sort of like asking a Catholic priest to teach a course on sex education. Is that really a good idea? So I think the most important thing is really to continue to develop a revolutionary theory which can guide the working class and so our theoretical work, I think, is very important. And since most of us are heavily into theory, I think it's very important. But of course, it has to be combined with practice. And finally, let me say a few more things um, about, uh, well, since we live in the belly of the beast, what are the actual possibilities of us actually confronting the beast and doing what needs to be done? And I wrote down some of the people that, uh, uh, trouble with having a smartphone, isn't it? Uh, it has a mind of its own. But, uh, so I listed these here. First of all, um, two of the political parties that I look to for guidance is the Communist Party USA. Um, but keep first PSL and answer DSA the squad of burners and the poor people's campaign. I want to touch on each of these real briefly. Communist Party DSA, I think that we have people who know, know more about that uh, and they, their influence is uh, wider than we might think, but uh, we don't know uh, how exactly how wide it is and how likely they are to provide revolutionary leadership. And I think that's a defect, but they are comrades um, I'll just say, again, as I've said before, I am not now, nor have I ever been a member of the Communist Party. Um, um, but I have been very greatly influenced by members of the Communist Party from Herbert Aptheker, who spoke at Yale. And that was one of the reasons that uh, kind of messed me up at Yale, because I found his work to be much more... Uh, much stronger, more powerful than the Yale professors of anthropology I had that were into um, to um, Levi Strauss and other other people like that. So idealists. So again, uh, 
um, I've all, always uh, admired the people who do take the step and join the Communist Party. Um, the other group um, is PSL, uh, Party for Socialism and Liberation. Many of us voted for Gloria Laviva, uh, and I had the slogan, it is glorious to vote for Gloria. Um, but uh, she presents uh, a very important thing, partly because she is the only presidential candidate we had that did not engage in China bashing. She supported the People's Republic of China and other countries. So that is very important. And ANSWER is bound to be a major player in terms of any demonstrations, uh, irrespective of what Trump, the, the final, final uh, verse of uh, Trump's farewell song is going to be. So I think they're a very important group we need to keep track of. DSA is a very contradictory uh, organization. I've been a member of DFSA since, the, uh, since they were formed back in the 1980s, I think. Um, not because they shared their views, they're basically a social democratic party and a pro-imperialist party, but um, uh, they always have been, but since the election of um, Trump, they have increased dramatically and they've done some pretty good things, I have to say, even though their um, ideology, I think, has problems with it, they're learning. And um, uh, I think we need to, they need to be watched carefully. And then there's the squad, uh, the people, who, uh, AOC, uh, Rashida Talib, Ilhan, and um, the, 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 uh, there's another one. And now those have been joined by people like Cory Bush of the Black, uh, uh, Black People Matter, um, Black Lives Matter movement, and so forth. This is bringing a certain enthusiasm which has a certain legitimacy in terms of being on the floors of Congress and being able to provide a real um, electoral and, and uh, um, uh, um, congressional opposition to what's going on. And although that may not be uh, enough to turn the tide, I think it's very important. And they also have, uh, are regularly engaged in demonstrations. Um, uh, of one, uh, in, in and around the capital and globally, so uh, and nationwide. So I think that's important. And there's also um, um, uh, the Poor People's Campaign, which uh, is taking steps. They have a regular program derived from Martin Luther King's program, um, which includes uh, getting rid of the war budget and other things like that. Reverend uh, Barber uh, is very active in this regard. Uh, he pursues the uh, um, message, I think, of um, Dr. King, but also includes in, in his uh, message uh, definite environmental concerns and other concerns. So I, I think um, that's something else. And I remember when I went down to look at uh, one of the early meetings of the Poor People's Campaign here in Oakland. Um, I was, I, I had written to them and I, was, I also gave a quick talk there about Vets for Peace, but um, the, um, I looked around me and I'd been in, in the uh, End the War Coalition of our usual suspects of lefties and people from left parties and so forth. And None of the same people were there. It was a completely different group of people there than are in the uh, socialist sectarian left uh, parties. Uh, these were mostly people of faith, a large chunk of um, black people and people of color, uh, people of gender also, uh, LGBT people and so forth. Very inclusive organization and they didn't give so much give speeches as they had poor people talk uh, and gay people talk and lesbians talk and trans and so forth. So it was a very different mix. And, um, you know, but that's, these are all separate movements and there has to be some way 
of uh, bringing them together. And um, uh, I don't have the magic key to that, but uh, this is a group uh, responsibility. And the last thing I wanna say is I've been very active in the movement to stop the Cold War on China, to our Vets for Peace passed a national resolution saying, you know, end, end the Cold War on China and the world, pivot to peace with China and the world. And this is crucial because these are, like it or not, the two most powerful countries in the world. Um, you know, America stands for, um, again, imperialism as we know is waging imperialism, but that's not the people that are waging imperialism. It's the 1%, it's the power structure that, we, that uh, Stan Smith dissected for us so, so well last time. Um, so they represent um, imperialism. China, um, on the other hand, in my view, represents the working class. They are the largest component of that, the most effective component. But um, I think this movement to um, this pivot to peace with China and the world uh, is something I personally will continue to push forward. And um, with that, I will stop, turn it back over to you, Raj. Thank you, Gene. We're going to do this. And very informative uh, lecture and uh, um, very succinct summary of your point of view. Um, in all this, uh, I agree. Uh, uh, that this is a very important subject, but let's go to uh, our uh, discussion session. But before we go to discussion, uh, Jean, will you make the announcement for, you already did actually what's coming up, but you want to- Well, I, I think since in? you are what's coming up, uh, yes. Raj, perhaps uh, you should best uh, tell people about- I, I just want to say about that one, one thing that I'll be speaking that the title is somewhat mislabeled because I was preparing and, and I wrote the title before I prepared. So the title really should be uh, The Logic of Capitalist Production and Marx and Engels uh, Ecology because it's really Engels is the main uh, uh, develop, uh, developer of thoughts on ecology. Marx gave it a Marx is, of course, involved in this. So anyway, I'll be talking next week. But what's coming up the following week is Grover first talk. So but but now uh, also I want to ask if uh, uh, fund appeal, uh, uh, Rich Fallenbaum wants to make a fund appeal in person. I know he put up in the chat the information. Okay. Richard, uh, do you want to say something about the fund appeal on uh, appeal for funds? Okay, maybe Richard will come back later on. Uh, so oh, I'm ready. I'm oh, you're ready. ready. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I just yeah, have to be unmuted. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, well, I, um, as you know, as most of you know, we continue to need funds for IS, ICSS and the Niebuhr Proctor Marxist Library. There's a um, there's a description on how you can contribute. To through PayPal or through by a check, in the at the beginning of the chat, you just need to um, scroll through through there, and um, you can contribute that way. It'd be much appreciated. Number of people have continued to to make contributions, some on a regular basis, actually, and we very much appreciate it. Thank okay. you. All right, so then let's go to the discussion session. Okay. I will go off um, screen share. That's yeah, okay, yeah, I think that's better. So uh, let's see uh, who who is going to uh, be the first one. I don't see any hands yet. Uh, so first thing, maybe I should start it off by commenting. So Gene, I want, I agree, want to agree with you on, on Richard Wolf. Richard Wolf actually, said for the 10 years 
the workers were distributed land, but you are absolutely right. It was not a private land. It was uh, completely, as you said, Lenin's decree uh, finished uh, the uh, old private ownership of land. So in that sense, Richard was wrong uh, uh, and misleading, if not wrong. Uh, it was not privatized. They did get individual plots, which was later collectivized. And he said 10 years, and he was implying that Len Stalin came back and collectivized the land. But in all times, you were absolutely right, this was the case. So I, with that, I hope somebody else is here to comment. I'll come back with more of my comments later. I want to have others comment now. I don't want to be the uh, for first and the last one. So um, uh, this subject looks like everybody so agrees with Eugene. Nobody wants to say anything. Everybody agrees. No, no, I think Jack, so I see a hand. Oh, no, I see two hands. Okay. okay. Yusuf and, uh, and Richard Fallenbaum. So we'll start with Yusuf. Uh, please unmute yourself. Okay. And I'm going to lower your hand. Uh, well, uh, Jack Hirschman will come later. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, among the people you listed in the US, uh, well, uh, Martin Luther King is no doubt a revolutionary working class hero. Uh, but however, uh, he was not very ideological. He was not very theoretical uh, in his approach. Uh, so, uh, in the, um, um, but, but um, uh, uh, Eugene Debs was certainly a socialist, uh, but uh, uh, the New Deal and uh, 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 Bernie Sanders, uh, I would classify as uh, social uh, democrats rather than socialists. They, they have a role to play. That uh, I'm, I'm not denying that, but uh, uh, those two I would not uh, include in socialism in this uh, sense that we use it. Gene, you want to uh, respond to that? Well, well you no, know, no. One of my points is, for, for me, uh, the revolutionary core of socialism lies in those societies that actually had socialist revolutions, which would be the Soviet Union, China, Cuba, and other societies that have had this thing, because they're at a different stage. Their goals and, and so forth are different than uh, ours are. Um, but again, but then if we look at um, what's going on here in the United States, but you know, after 1914, the, the socialist movement, the working class movement basically split uh, when the uh, social Democrats, Democratic, I mean, before this, Lenin called himself a social democrat. Um, but afterwards, after 1914, and that uh, vote in, in the Diet, where the uh, German Democratic Social Party uh, decided to support the war and vote credits for that, which they'd all agreed before this, they're not going to do that. But at that point, they did. And this was traumatic. Um, but then after that, Rosa Luxemburg, Karl Liebknecht, and others pulled themselves together. And by, in 1918, there was another attempt uh, at a revolution in, in, uh, in Germany. And that was brutally crushed. Uh, uh, Rosa Luxemburg was killed and thrown in the river. Uh, and um, that put an end, basically, to them thinking about having an actual revolution and they turn to what I consider a different form, another form of socialism, namely social democracy. Whether you call it social democracy or um, uh, uh, democratic socialists, um, uh, I consider, consider them comrades, I consider them part of the movement that we have to deal with in a in an honest and upfront manner. So I do consider that. And the same thing with the I think the New Deal. Uh, they didn't call themselves socialists, but they had a lot of, um, you know, social democratic views that, that, that they actually did implement and they improved the conditions for the working class, which I think is a crucial thing that socialists have to do. Um, okay, so I, and as far as his theory, he is a liberation theologian, black liberation theology. 
and it is a very um, worthy of careful study, I would say. But again, he was also nonviolent. And we have to think about, well, what's the coming impending revolution? What form is it going to take? And we don't know. Anyway, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Gene. And then Richard Fallenbaum is next. <clears throat> yeah, it seems to me one of the big uh, controversial questions is about the, uh, about the Chinese revolution, is about the um, opening up, uh, the, the, the introduction of some uh, private capital and, the, um, and foreign investment in China, and the same thing about the Soviet Union. Uh, I wonder if you if you could give a if you can give a Marxist interpretation of that, uh, or at least point us to some Marxist scholars who've done some work. I have some ideas about it myself, but you know they're just ideas. But I'd rather. Hear them. <laughs> <coughs> Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, and I do have some ideas, and I do cover that in, in, in the book more than otherwise. But, I, you know, I think one of the, <clears throat> there are lots of problems the Soviet Union did have. Um, and, uh, but in my view, um, it was overthrown. It did not uh, fall of its own accord uh, because, um, you know, Gigi's book, uh, she was, you know, on life in the Soviet Union in, in the 80s. People were doing pretty well in the 80s and then life was continuing to improve in the Soviet Union. And they actually took a vote, uh, I think in nine, 1989, I think, before the same vote that uh, at the same time Yeltsin was elected president. Um, they took a vote, you know, do you support the Soviet Union? And it was overwhelming. So over 70% said, yes, we support the Soviet Union. And Yeltsin did not uh, run on that, on that uh, uh, platform. So uh, again, the Soviet Union didn't fall, but it overthrew, was overthrown. And part of the reason I insist is that they were overthrown is because they gave up the idea of the dictatorship of the proletariat. They wanted to have the, uh, uh, you know, a, uh, common humanity should all unite uh, was their idea, which was kind of attractive idea. And many of us uh, in the eighties, we thought Yeltsin and or, 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 or Gorbachev and and Glasnost and Perestroika, here was this old communist party and so forth, but they were coming up forth with this new ideas that were very exciting and, but unfortunately, um, it didn't work, partly because they did not have the idea that uh, they did not understand the concept of uh, the dictatorship on the proletariat. China, on the other hand, did. And on the very day, um, when, uh, which was uh, June 4th, 1989, um, this was the day that Lost, uh, um, um, solidarity won a very important electoral victory leading to, which is a crucial part of the fall of the Eastern Bloc as then the Soviet Union. That was the day that the Chinese Communist Party took the appropriate re reaction and ended the attempted um, uh, counter-revolution that was uh, associated with People call it the, you know, the massacre at Tiananmen Square. Well, it wasn't in Tian Tiananmen Square, it was elsewhere. And it's the Battle of Beijing. But these people were counter-revolutionaries. That's been pretty well established. So China took the appropriate action there. It survived and I think took over, I consider leadership of the International Socialist Movement, but they're doing it differently than the Soviet Union did because there are different times. Uh, it's not the same conditions that the Soviet Union uh, had. And again, part of the reason, <clears throat> you know, Deng Xiaoping um, adopted this policy of uh, opening up, that um, it, it was, you know, people, um, I mean, first of all, Mao made very significant changes in terms of uh, opening China and opening negotiations with uh, um, 
Nixon and all this, and gaining admission to the United Nations. So these are very important things that laid the basis for further things. But the other side of it is, you know, you had a great high degree of equality uh, under under uh, during the Maoist period, but it was an equality of poverty, and many of the Chinese people had relatives in in Hong Kong, in Taiwan, in in um, Singapore, and so forth, and in the United States, and they could see well these Chinese people that are in these other countries are doing quite well, and why aren't we doing well? And partly in response to this is when they in, issued this opening up. We need a new way of dealing with this because people want, don't want a equality and poverty. They want to have a richer life. And even if some people get richer faster, everybody will get rich. <clears throat> and as we can see, that policy has had very important, <clears throat> excuse me, very important uh, consequences. And, you know, it has worked. Yes, some people got rich, got richer and got rich faster than others, but the Chinese people as a whole have benefited by that and they support it. So I think that's, for me, that qualifies as socialism. I know other people may have different views on that, but um, I'm not here to argue for your views. I'm here to argue for my views. So. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh... Mark Albertson is next. Oh, sorry, Jack Kirschman. I'll ask him first because he said he has to leave early. So Jack, please go. And then followed by uh, Jack would be Mark Albertson. Go ahead, Jack. Hi. Thank you, Gene, for generally what I think is was a very good synopsis. I'm here basically because when we speak of socialism in the 21st century, I'm focusing on the United States. Now the United States has 800 military bases all over the world. It is the most imperialist country in the history of the earth. It is, its military bases, bases is rooted in a capitalism that it insists upon. And as we all know, in the recent election, we had a fascist president getting 74 million votes, losing to a moderate Democrat who's tied to the corporate state. And I... I always quote Mussolini saying fascism is not the correct word. The correct word is corporatism. We've been living under a fascist corporate state since the end of the Second World War. How do we turn that into a socialism? Well, it was in the recent election that the beginning of it actually happened because the vote of the black people in this country, which is the mark, the beginning of the socialism that's going to happen. It is actually that vote that has brought about the election of Biden, even though, and it, this is a contradiction, the fascism exists. It exists in the votes too, because Trump got that many votes. And as you know, Trump is viciously opposed to anything like socialism or communism. So it's at the minutes. same time, and this is the contradiction, the black vote in this country leads the way to the possibility of the socialism. Our job is to turn the race question into the class question in the future. Thank you, Jack. Uh, Gene, you want to respond to it or you want to let Mark? Well, I just want to say first. just yeah. a couple of things. Thank you very much for that. And much of it, I, you know, I, I do agree. And we had a very good talk last week from Stan Smith on the mechanism, how the US dominates the world. And that was very instructive. And it's not only through military means, but also through um, 
financial and uh, the media and so forth. So, um, yeah, I agree. That's really important. And, uh, you know, the vote, um, I think the somebody pointed out that what, what percentage of people, you know, looked at the two candidates and said, no, thanks, we're just not going to vote. Uh, and I don't know if that would be a majority or but probably a third of the people. I don't, I didn't, haven't, I've looked at the statistics, but don't remember them too well. So I think we need to look at that very carefully. And um, also along your lines there, um, you know, Mussolini didn't call fascism that term, but may, may, I don't know. But I know that Hitler called his movement national socialism. And yeah. I do have a section there where I point out, you know, they may use the term, but that it's not socialism, um, national socialism or Nazism or fascism is diametrically opposed to uh, socialism uh, or communism. Yes. And it took place because yes. of the failure of socialism to deal with things. And the same thing is true of Trump. If you look at Trump, what do you tell Biden during the, during the, uh, um, uh, debates. He says, I'm here because of you, because you had 45 years to do something and you failed. That's why I'm so popular. So I, I, agree. I agree. And we do need to work on that. Okay. Mark Albertson, please go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to go back to what was mentioned earlier about, um, about uh, Stalin and, uh, and, and it was intimated with Lenin too, about um, collectivizing the peasant. I mean, let's understand something. Stalin in 1927, when he's going to put this program together, understood one thing, that when uh, the Tsar mobilized Russia in 1914, Russia was the least organized, least industrialized, least prepared to go into an industrialized war. I mean, let's understand another thing here, too. There is no World War I or World War II. There's only one war. It's the Great War, 1914-1922. And 1931 to 1945. And this marks the end of the Euro white Christian colonial European dominance after centuries. 1945 marked the end of this. Henceforth, what we call the Cold War, because two countries are going to win this war. One is the United States, the other two is the Soviet, the other one is the Soviet Union. Why? Because they were the two most powerful industrialized states able to wage an industrialized, corporatized, commercialized war. But when Stalin began his program of forced industrialization, that's what this was, forced industrialization. He, he, collect, he was gonna he collectivize the peasantry. He also pinched some of their grain and their livestock. Now this is fascinating because there's a historical parallel and it's in this country. It's called the Confederacy. That's what they began doing in 1862 because when you're gonna have a, a huge army to fight the North, armies are what? Armies are consumers. They're a huge group of consumers. They don't produce anything. You need to feed them. Stalin understood that this is what's gonna have to happen because he knew another war was coming. That Versailles was the biggest fraud ever perpetrated on modern man. And so by 1941-42, the Soviet Union is the world's second leading industrial power. And so in Soviet industrialization, forced industrialization by Stalin, is one of the biggest secrets for allied victory in World War II. And just a, one more point here, in 1942 alone, in 1942, they already have at least 4.5 million military dead by early March, 1942. Yet throughout the entire year of 1942, the Germans produced 5,997 tanks and assault guns. Without our help, no Lend-Lease, without our help, uh, Chelyabinsk in the Urals, Tankograd as it was known, which was the world's biggest tank producing combine, produced 24,668 tanks and assault guns. It's a fascinating story, Stalin's program of industrialization. It's fascinating. Did and you yet it gets have, the short have a question or, or anything, Mark, yeah. anything else? Okay, uh, so time's up. Uh, thank you, uh, Mark. It could be let's said to say what needs to be said. He's giving us good information. 
You want to finish, uh, Mark, or? or did well, you... I taught a course on the Great Patriotic War. Okay. You know, it's World War II from the Eastern Front solely. And, you know, you're going back to a country, meaning the Soviet Union. Uh, you know, in this country, what was, what, what, what was the rallying cry? Remember Pearl Harbor, right? What That's... was the rallying cry in the Soviet Union? Comrade, kill your German. Their backs are to the wall. They know what they have to do. And so interesting here, they're gonna lose 25 million people in 47 months. What'd the US lose? According to the Navy Department, 405,399 dead. Right. Who Mark, beat the I'll Germans? I'll come back to you. Mark, I'll come back to you, but your time's up. So if you're Thank okay you. with that, I will come back to you if you wanna come second If I may time. say so, something. Yeah. If I may say something. Quick, uh, something quick. In, in 1929, Giga Vertov, a filmmaker, made a film on the, uh, the death of Lenin. In that film, there was Stalin and Trotsky. They were carrying the, the casket. And in that same film, mind you, the date was 1929. There's a woman on her belly shooting. And what she shoot? A Red Army woman shooting at a swastika. In 29, they knew, and Stalin knew, that the Nazis were coming. And his vast collectivization was to catch up, catch up with in, industrially speaking. He right. did it in 10 years, what it took more than 100 years in, say, the United States. He did it in 10 years. And he was accused of cruelty and he was tough. There was no doubt about it. But there was a reason for it, because they knew the Nazis were coming down the pike. Okay, thank you, Jack. Gene, you want to comment on any of this? Well, I just want to say that basically, uh, I agree with much of what's been said here. And the, first of all, it's absolutely true that, that it was the Soviet Union that crushed, um, uh, played the leading role in defeating uh, Nazi Germany. Absolutely. Uh, this is what uh, uh, um, Churchill said. It was the Red Army that tore the guts out right. of the not filthy Nazis, he said. Right. So, I mean, that, that's true. Um, and the other thing is, it's rarely acknowledged that uh, the war in the Pacific, we, we think, oh yeah, this is where America won this war. Well, the Chinese lost more people in that war. They lost the two, two biggest uh, death rates in World War II, uh, or the Great War, the war to end all, with, with that war. Um, you know, it was the Soviet Union and China. Right. They won both, both lost somewhere between 20 and 30 million people each because of that. And it was the Communist Party of China, as well as the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, that led that defeat to the defeat of not only European fascism, but Japanese fascism. So I, I, I think, and, and that's not to say America did not play a role. I think it's important that they did. But again, going back, you know, in 19, around 1927 or something, Stalin looked at the situation and said, the imperialist countries are a hundred years ahead of us economically. Either we make up that difference in 10 years or they will crush us. And I want to point out, yes, it was a forced industrialization, but let's not think that the British industrialization was not forced. I mean, think of all the uh, workers in, in, in England were driven off their land and forced into the factories. Think what happened. I mean, the British Industrial Revolution was 1776, right? Uh, that was the date usually given to the Industrial Revolution and so on. Well, that was just 20 years after the conquest of India. And all that wealth was stolen from India as well as the rest of the world, went in to finance British industrialization. So that was a very costly uh, industrialization. And the whole world paid the cost for that. Not just the British people, but Indian people throughout the world. So I just wanted to add, to, but thank you very much. I, I, I do agree with you. Thank you, Jean. Next person is Sharon. Uh, Sharon, please uh, start your... Uh, I, I have two points. Uh, one, I thank you, Mark, for what you said. I agree with everything you said. Um, 
thank you for raising, reminding us of that history. Um, the only thing I would add, I agree that it was all one war. And of the, the whole first part of the 20th century was characterized by the slaughter of millions of people. Um, I, al I also think, however, my, my opinion is that, that the Soviets eventually lost to the Nazis, or another way of saying it, 1989 was the victory, the final victory of the Nazis. The Soviets never recovered from losing their best cadre. They lost every single one of their best cadre in that war. And they made some bad mistakes ideologically or in, in terms of educating people and um, about what they were doing, what the long-term go goal of what they were doing was, building socialism. Um, and I, I, I'm sure I don't know all the mistakes they made, but I, in my view, um, they never recovered, even though they helped rid the world of, of Hitler and, um, and the Japanese imperialists. Um, I wanted to say, I wanted to remark on the, what Jean said about how the slogan, workers of the world unite became workers and peasants unite. Actually then, Lenin, under Le Lenin helped evolve that even further when it actually became workers, peasants, and nationally oppressed people unite. And it's really important to remember that national liberation struggles historically have, um, have been, able, in some cases, have been able to go over into the struggle for socialism. The most clear example is Vietnam, but there are, there are others. So I think we should not lose sight of that. Thank you. Okay, two more people have raised hands, but they have spoken before. So I first want to go around and ask uh, those who have not spoken and have not raised hand, anybody wants to come on uh, before I go to them. Okay, so before I go to them, I just wanted to make one brief comment myself, which is the term forced industrialization and forced collectivization is, is actually not fair term. I mean, I think the intention was not to blame Stalin by Mark or other gene, but saying the circumstances forced it. But actually uh, this was the way to move, as Gene pointed out, move fast forward. Otherwise they're gonna get crushed as Gene said. So it was forced by circumstance and uh, uh, one interesting thing about that is that uh, they used the surplus from the peasant uh, collective farming, which produced surplus in exchange, uh, uh, aside, along with the raw materials, which they had plenty to get machinery from Germany. That the only country they could trade with because everybody else was blocking them. So this was their way of uh, industrializing and that's what they did. Uh, now, interestingly, just a quick comparison with China, you can say that China in 1979 onwards has taken the strategy that the West, I mean, China's Communist Party, the West has capital and is desperate for return. We need industrialization. So you, they used it as well for that. So it's kind of like what Stalin did, you can defend it that way. The trouble with that point of view, in my opinion, is this. What has happened is actually creation of a capitalist class in China. And although the Communist Party is strong, they can reverse course. But the question is eventually the rod gets in. And that's the point, is that you have a highly differentiated society where the workers are working not 40 hours a week, they're working more or like 46, 47 hours a week. And in, in, uh, in, in uh, uh, Jack Ma's uh, and other such high-tech thing, they're working, their rule is nine, nine, six, nine to nine every day, six days a week, and don't complain about it. So the work culture is worse, in fact, than the United States. 
and the differentiation of incomes, that's the characteristic of a capitalist society. To say that this is defect, the socialism actually doesn't pronounce it. Yes, you can do it temporarily, but for having done it for 35, 40 years is a concern. So I, I think maybe uh, Jean wants to respond to that. You do that, but before that, let me go to, Jean, is it okay if I go to Yusuf and Mark and then you can come back and rebut my... my uh, uh, definitely, yeah, you're the man, you're in charge. Okay, all right, no, no, I don't want to be a special favor. Uh, okay, Yusuf, you're next. Uh, well, uh, industrialization is essential for socialism and uh, the underlying assumption in Marx is that there will be uh, technological development, technological and economic development. I mean, if you if they have a climate disaster or nuclear war, you won't get socialism. You're back to square one. Uh, so, uh, uh, well, the crude argument is that you need, a, first of all, a sufficiently big pie to, to be able to do, divide it evenly. You have just a cupcake uh, and you divide it evenly. Uh, nobody, uh, you can't satisfy anybody. So uh, industrialization is a, a economic development is essential for socialism. And there was a, uh, a a Cuban uh, diplomat was a, a guest speaker and look where uh, we seek uh, a economic development without ec a economic development, you can't have socialism. Uh, and he was very correct. So, uh, he, so that's my, uh, that's something that should be very much borne in mind when discussing this. Okay, Jean, do you want to respond to these two comments or, or you want to take Mark Albertson as well? And then we'll let, let, let me kind of um, say something here because yes, um, first of all, you're absolutely right. I mean, this is, this, those two wars were, you know, were world wars and Asia was involved in both World War I and World War II. So I think that's crucial. But I also think it's important to know that it hasn't stopped. Um, you know, the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki was simply the start of what I call World War III. Because if you look at what's happened uh, after, you know, after 1945, the war in Vietnam and the war, the wars in, against Asian countries began immediately, both uh, Vietnam and Korea uh, declared independent countries. They're, 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 you know, the People's Republic of Vietnam, People's Republic of Korea, and they were both attacked uh, by the United States. The, the United States sent France in first. They lost to Dan Men Phu. But, there was, but if you look at the casualties, somewhere between 20 and 30 million people have been killed in since World War II in US led wars and many more but led refugees. We see the situation going on now and that's just a continuation of imperialist wars against socialist nations. And Ho Chi Minh, as we know, was a member of the Communist Party and as was um, uh, um, Kim Il-sung. So I think we know that this is a war of imperialism against the people of the world against socialism. Um, and again, uh, the other thing is um, I have a different view than Sharon about the recuperation of the Soviet Union because um, when Stalin died, uh, the Soviet Union had largely recuperated in many respects in terms of its industrialization and in terms of its um, uh, uh, housing and other things, as, as I understand it. I may be wrong on that. But the other thing is this, so, the uh, Soviet people had all the benefits of the revolution. They were guaranteed jobs, guaranteed health care, guaranteed free education. And as I said before, the cultural level of the, of, of the Soviet people was much higher. They read more books, they saw more plays, they went to more films than workers in the West. 
And it said that a Soviet woman could go to the Bolshoi Ballet, the best, finest in the world, for five kopecks, with or without her husband, because this was all subsidized by the, by the state. So I think uh, I agree with um, our, our, our comrade Gigi Winter and her book on, I forget what it's called, but uh, she was a tour guide in the, <clears throat> the Soviet Union in, in, in the 80s. And her description says that basically people were living much better. And I think polls say people looking back at the Brezhnev period, this is the era they would like to live in. You know, everything was all tops and turvy under Gorbachev, and there was lots of privatization before that, but Gorbachev held the country together. So I just wanted to say that in terms of um, uh, what okay, took place afterwards. And uh, I know I'll have more to say later. Um, it's hard to get me to stop talking, but. Okay, uh, thank you, Gene. Mark Albertson. I just wanted to reinforce something Gene brought up before, uh, talking about the Industrial Revolution. Britain usurping the resources of, of India as an example here. Uh, you know how these, all, all these colonial powers do that. And, the, and, you, know, and you go back to, um, go back to the uh, Versailles Treaty discussions and Woodrow Wilson with his 14 points that people would be able to determine their own fate when this war was over with, that kind of thing. And at one point, Georges Clemenceau, who's really concerned about France, France wanting France needing to retain the con colonies to rebuild its economy after 1918, uh, is, is laments to Lloyd George and he says, you know, a Woodrow Wilson bores me silly with his 14 points, why God Almighty only had 10 commandments. And Lloyd George says to him, don't worry, you'll still have access to your big nigger armies. That's what he told him. That's what he told him. And we talk about Trump. Uh, one quick one too was uh, uh, um, John Maynard Keynes, remember him? There's a whole school of economics named after him. He was a young advisor to Lloyd George. And when the thing about Poland came up, re have, re you know, re having, having Poland come back, he told Lloyd George that Poland was an economic impossibility whose sole major export will be Jew baiting. Now, these are the people who are deciding the so-called post-war period, and they're going to draw the borders. So it's interesting who is deciding in this post-war period, but then it kind of reinforces what Gene said earlier about, col about imperialist colonial powers. You know, once you get a taste of this, you don't want to give it up. Okay, uh, thank you, Mark. Gene, you want to respond to that? Uh, no, I, I generally agree. And uh, there, I wanted to get back to some other things, but uh, I forgot what they were. But so. Uh, well, I don't have uh, any hands up right now. Um, I also agree, so I'll fill in. Uh, I also agree with Gene that the fall of the Soviet Union is not uh, primarily from Second World War. Second World War did do a lot of damage, recovery was made and Soviet Un Union moved forward. I think the problem, the second, uh, fall of the Soviet Union is related to the rift between China and Soviet Union, which was very unfortunate. And I don't want to say who's to blame, but this rift is, is what set the whole so socialist project of the 20th century back. And had they, handled it better between them, we might not be here where we are, really pulled back and China forced into, uh, into a capitalist mechanism, which I'm very afraid will not lead back towards socialism, but away from socialism. That's my worry. And signs are that China is more and more working within the mechanics of capitalist property and capitalist profit making and rate of profit, et cetera, is governed by that. So that's the question is, it'd be interesting to see if they can reverse it. Maybe they can, but after 40 years, they've only moved in one direction. That's my worry. So go ahead, Gene. If yeah, you want. I want, yeah, I want to take uh, a number of things, but I, 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 I did want to say a couple of things came up that I wanted to, uh, didn't include. And everybody knows Jack Ma, I think. He's the founder of Alibaba, said to be the second richest man in China, a member of the Communist Party. 
And just within the last week, um, uh, he was going to put, he was making a, what was said to be the, you know, the, the world's history's largest uh, initial, they were, they were going public, Alibaba, I think, going public. It was the initial stock offer, um, um, offering of this was going to be, it was a major event. Um, but um, apparently he gave a speech that uh, he, the Communist Party did not like. And basically they pulled the plug on him. They, uh, they said it's the you know, most expensive speech in history because, and it just basically taught Jack Ma and others that are in the Communist Party that they don't run the party. They play by the rules laid down by the Communist Party, not by the capitalists themselves. So I think that's important. A couple of other things are going on very interesting that uh, some of the news items just, just talked about. The RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Plan, was initiated <clears throat> by the people, uh, by the governments of Southeast Asia, um, Malaysia, and they brought in um, China and um, uh, Korea and Japan as, as part of this economic network, which is the largest economic uh, trade deal in history, much different than the World Trade Organization because its rules are set within themselves. And it still has, it has been announced, it hasn't been totally approved, has been put into effect. But that's gonna change things because that's going to incorporate basically a third of the world economy and running according to their rules, not uh, the rules of the WTO or the United States. And we're still, that's just come into the news in the last couple of weeks. Um, linked into that. <clears throat> also, another thing is that we hear um, news item came through that uh, China is going has started to uh, import oil from Venezuela directly on its own ships. Prior, they they went around the corner. They had had the, had the ships be loaded in Venezuela and then go to go to sea, and then they would transfer it to a Chinese ship and take it to China. Now they do it directly. Leaves Caracas, goes directly into a Chinese port, um, which again, challenges US trade sanctions in a very important way. And also, um, at the same time, they announced that um, poverty alleviation, they have a big deal to alleviate poverty in a fairly significant area, the way they're alleviating poverty in, in, in China by building housing, building public process there in Venezuela. So there, this, I think uh, I agree entirely. Imperialism is not dead but, and it's not dying of its own accord, but socialism is winning, uh, but it's not going to do, happen overnight. It's a long ongoing process, but I think, um, you know, and, and I, I don't think uh, um, Biden is going to be able to reestablish the empire. I think too many uh, things are going on, and we haven't even mentioned COVID, you know, and that, that, that uh, China's project in COVID, they, they are making this part of their international thing, making it available free to countries in Africa and elsewhere. So I think um, if we look at the total picture, I think. Uh, you know, the forces of socialism, which I include China, are much stronger. And um, imperialism is on the way out. And I think, um, but it still has a lot of destructive power left with, left with it. And I'll just remind you about the Cuban Missile Crisis, when the American, American imperialists were willing to blow up the world in order to make sure that the socialists in Cuba and elsewhere didn't take over. And I fear that they're still willing to do that. Hopefully, um, you know, there are forces within the United States that have some sanity, but... Um, Norma, you're yeah. next. Anyway. Norma Harrison? Yes. <clears throat> well, Yusuf has had his hand up for quite some time. Uh, but Why don't you, you ask him? Before, so therefore I'm... Hello? Hello? Yes. Uh, 
I said Yusuf has had his hand up, and I think it's probably in response to some earlier comments. I'm going to say something else. Uh, but uh, I'm going by this okay. thing. Those who have not I know, started. I know. You got your rules right. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's <clears throat> it's a damn shame. Here is China interfering in everything. How many uh, millions is it? Is it 1.2 billion people in China that it's forcing to have housing and uh, uh, you know care and uh, feeding and so forth and it's a terribly imperial, I, mean, I was probably speaking mainly to Raj, and now they're going across the seas into Africa and into Venezuela, which is Venezuela, what a big challenge to reroute it itself so that it's having direct exchange and support for the socialist going Venezuela that is driving the United States mad. <laughs> Our owners are going crazy watching Venezuela continue to succeed. So it's a terrible, terrible imperium that China is exacting all you know, farther and farther away and within its own boundaries, borders, uh, making, making more and more people materially comfortable and secure uh, into next generations. Uh, so, yeah, we really have to worry about ch China becoming, I don't know, capitalist? Uh, Yusuf? Okay, well, immediately I have a question to Norma. Maybe she could answer afterwards, but that was not my point. Um, the, you mean getting comfortable makes socialists... Uh, I, I, that I couldn't quite understand, uh, and I wouldn't. And I know the left. The left has a lot of trouble understanding nice. Uh, well, anyway, um, uh, I, I want to respond to Sharon. Actually, uh, said uh, a, uh, a national liberation movements more socialism, and she mentioned uh, Vietnam as an example. Actually. Uh, it was uh, led from the beginning by the Vietnamese, uh, by the Communist Party of Vietnam. Uh, uh, it was a, 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 a socialist movement from the beginning. It, it sought allies. Uh, it, it grew uh, because of a, a national liberation question. Uh, but uh, uh, I think that's a falsehood that uh, uh, I know the Turkish, uh, uh, the left in Turkey paid dearly in the 1960s that, uh, that there, was, there was a movement and it, it, it got the enthusiasm of uh, youth in Turkey uh, that uh, so the party wasn't necessary, that uh, should concentrate that the, the, the one grand uh, anti-imperialist movement would uh, eventually uh, morph into socialism, and was explained why. And uh, they they made uh, uh, terrible errors uh, uh, as a result. Uh, no, for socialism you need the working class. Uh, so that's my point. Okay. Uh, oh, can I can I add another yeah, thing to what I said? Yeah, there's nobody else raising hand. Yeah, uh, and that is when you talk about uh, you know the, the, all the things I said about China making things materially secure and uh, useful and pleasant for the uh, more and more people for the mass of people. <clears throat> but wouldn't you need an an oppressed class? I mean. The United States, of course, has always, and, and the capitalist countries have all always relied on having a slave labor. Well, besides besides the working class slaves, these would be the marginalized, excluded slaves that have no or very little access to self maintenance, health care, and food, and so housing, so forth. So you need to have that class that that knows that it is a hated 
group of people like black people, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the people on the street, uh, all those people that are, you have to have them as part of the capitalist structure. So uh, if China does away with that class, as it were, of people, uh, does that still count as being capitalist? Raj, actually, that I'm, I'm speaking to your concern about yeah. whether or not yeah. China is nevertheless going to end up capitalist. Well, I, my understanding about capitalism comes from Marx and Lenin, okay? Yeah, I know. Capitalism produces a profit for the capitalist and the worker, of course, has wages and works for that. And in fact, Marx actually once defined, and I don't, I couldn't find it exact uh, quote from Marx, asking what is wealth? So wealth really isn't having uh, money, wealth is when you can afford leisure. Can you afford leisure? Now, if, if work, people are working long hours, and I looked up in China, the working average working hours for throughout the society is 46 and a half hours. Some are working much more, some are perhaps working less than that, obviously, but 46 and a half hours is the average. Now, I'm I ran a small business in San Francisco and I found myself totally exhausted whenever I went over 40 hours. And uh, so I can't understand when would the, these people have time to relax? If, if for a short time, people have to do it to build their society, I think it's okay. But and as long as the benefit goes to everybody. But Let me say something about do, it. I'll just finish quickly. Nobody can deny the wealth is accumulating at one end and poverty, this is different definition of poverty, is accumulating on the other side because poverty isn't simply that you are absolutely poor, which is what Z wants to remove, which is good, absolute poverty, uh, living in rags, that he wants to remove, that's a good thing. But poverty's definition is not... Otherwise, you fall to bourgeois definition of poverty. That's not a Marxist definition of poverty. Poverty is a poverty of the class against the ruling class. Ruling class is capitalist class. Now, in China, I agree, the ruling class isn't capitalist class. So it makes an enigma as to what the hell it is. So I'm granting that China is special. Okay, go ahead. The thing that has to go along when ha when people have a full belly as i say guaranteed unto their children's children the definition of work will have to change there will have to not be that lower class that is this enslaved class for one thing people have to not be classified as workers ever they, we have to come away from that and find a way around that we can say the people who go to work is one thing, but making a person into an other, uh, rather than a human being, into a worker is not, is not our objective. And along with that, it's going to have to come the idea, the, defi uh, the definition of work has to change. Work has to become something we enjoy, something that is part of our lives, and it's a, not an eight hour a day obligation to go and slave someplace and come home, as you say, as uh, most people who go to jobs find. We have to have working conditions that are pleasant. For one thing, I, you know, I work against age segregation. I think that that's a very basic kind of way to keep us enslaved is not to allow our children to be around when we're doing whatever we're doing and the children learning so much by being around as it were uh, and teaching us, teaching the adults and having our uh, old people as part of the workers that are not slugging pieces of lumber around the world but are maybe putting a little bit of input into the way society is run and how they can participate. So it's a whole other way of seeing life together. 
And if life gets to be enriched materially and people understand that they can construct a way, uh, you know, the way to live that makes sense for people where they're not doing that eight hour a day horror, you know, which was a 16 hour a day horror, which was a child enslavement horror, the whole aura. I mean, we're still in the slave relationship to our owners, to our, to our hierarchy. You know? So we, we have to see that whole picture that was and, and hated a lot and not keep taking examples from it, structures, uh, institutions from it, like the job and like school, that institution of indoctrination. School is not, you know, my, my book, school is the opposite of education, uh, which doesn't deny the value of education. It says that everybody educates and we can all do it in a wholly different and pleasant way. Um, People can learn to read in, uh, you know, two weeks or something. It just works that way. Can so, go back at some point? Let's go back to Gene. Yes, you've been listening to us. Yeah, no, no, that's a very, very good. I really appreciate everybody's comments. It's been very fruitful for me. But uh, we're, co we're approaching uh, 1230, and I don't know what's going to happen then. But I did want to make a few points, <laughs> because this has been very fruitful for me, and it's been basically the topic I've been working on. and much of these, what's been said, everything that I've said, basically, I've been putting into my work in progress, which I have placed in my Dropbox. And um, uh, I think it's downloadable at what I put into the, both our um, uh, webpage, uh, icssmarks.org. There's a link there that you can click to my, Dropbox and get that. Uh, it's a little over a hundred pages. It'll be more, and it's still a work in progress. But I wanted people to at least have that because I cover many of these topics in more detail. And again, um, we appreciate the work. And I wanted to comment a co couple of things. Um, one is that um, you know people have talked about. Uh, the Russia was a backward country and had to industrialize. And that's true. And that led to a situation where socialism, typically the Marxist idea was that socialism would be a, a consequence of revolution and increased affluence. And uh, when socialism came to the Soviet Union, it had to become not a consequence of uh, of um, industrialization, but a way of industrializing that had become the means of industrializes. And this was basic transformation, I think. And in there, if you look back to the Communist Manifesto, uh, Marx says, they say, Marx and Engels say some in there that the communists turn their attention chiefly to Germany because that country is on the eve of a bourgeois revolution, which given the more advanced conditions uh, existing uh, at, at now, will immediately be turned into a proletarian revolution. That was in 1848. If you cross out 1848 and put in 1917 and substitute Russia for Germany, you have a pretty good evaluation what did in fact happen. Um, because at that time, the conditions were quite different. And the, although the Russian working class was a minority, it was the largest working class in Europe. Uh, well, consider the size of the population of the, of the Tsarist empire. It was a large working class. It was very well educated and had a lot of revolutionary traditions. Uh, people, could, this was the first country into, into which capital was translated. And the Russian workers, Russian revolutionaries were reading this avidly. So we had a peculiar situation um, leading to a very uh, contradictory society, but we have to expect that because all societies are contradictory as we know. But I think that the Soviet uh, accomplishments need to be put into that context. And of course they had to industrialize uh, and it would have been nice if things had worked out differently 
But as Ingalls says somewhere, history is about the cruelest of goddesses. Uh, because, and in this case, they decreed that socialism would come not as you know an affluent, perfect society, but in struggle. And that's the way it is, and we need to de deal with that. So, but I appreciate everybody's comments, and uh, I don't know for how long we're going to keep going. Um, but I want, did want to urge people. Uh, it, it's downloadable in my um, Dropbox. It's in the, the the link is in the web in the on our web page. But also, I think I may need to jiggle around with that because I'm not sure it's. I need to make sure it's, it works properly. So anyway. Uh, okay. I'll Gene, pause there. Thank you, Gene. It's twelve twenty-eight, so I I personally want to uh, sign off at twelve thirty uh, today. If somebody else wants to take over and the session continues, but I don't have anybody raising hands, so uh, we can also end the session today at twelve thirty if everybody agrees. But I'm perfectly happy to lead this on, but uh, somebody else take over as a moderator from, because I have, frankly, I have to prepare. I'm behind my preparation. So I'm just- But I'm sure it's gonna come up again when, during your talk, Raj. Yes. So I have we're, to, not, we're not done here. Uh, I know, but I have to prepare. I don't wanna waste other people's time in my talk. So I have to, I have to present something worth listening to. Uh, so yes, I, I would like to back off in about a minute's time with your permission. But how does, uh, uh, does, are there any questions or comments further? I don't see any raised hands. Uh, Yusuf has his hand up. Okay, Yusuf. Uh, yes, I see it. Sorry, I hadn't seen this. Brief Go ahead. Uh, brief announcement. Uh, since Richard Wolf was mentioned, uh, the Connecticut Peace Coalition is planning to invite him for a webinar on moving the money from military needs to to human needs, uh, beginning of January. It's an under preparation to give you more detail, but uh, yeah, since Richard Wolf was mentioned, I think it's worth mentioning. Thank you. By the way, I don't consider uh, Richard Wolf to be the expert on human history. And I think he is misled on, on what he was saying. So, but he, he provides a good critique of capitalism, in my opinion. Uh, I don't think he provides very good history of Soviet Union, but he provides a good critique of uh, capitalism here. I don't agree with his solution to it, what he's saying, cooperatives, because it kind of bypasses the revolutionary stage and it's not possible. So he's kind of, in some sense, misleading people. That's my comment. Anybody else has comment further? Otherwise, Gene, I go to you for your final comments, if you care to make some. Unmute and yeah. show ahead. my face again. But um, no, I think uh, I, did, I, as I said, I have been thinking about this for a long, for years, in fact, and it's been one of my projects. And this, what's been going on here in, in the library has been very useful uh, for me, uh, as I consider it my postdoctoral education, basically, in Marxism. And uh, I appreciate everybody's contributions on this. Um, so, uh, and if people want to take a look at what I've done so far and comment on it, I will, it's still rougher than I would like, but uh, uh, I will probably make some more changes over the next week and next month and try to get a new version out sometime in late uh, December or... Um, I thought we were anyway. doing the last part of this as uh, the can last I, half. Can I finish? Uh, for, for, I, I'm willing to stay on for another half hour and continue the discussion and continue to record this. I think uh, Mehmet, if we do record it, it may not appear at the end. I think uh, that decision has yet to be made. Uh, we're, we're still talking about what we're gonna do with the half hour. Uh, just, one, uh, just one warning there. Uh, Raj, if you're going to leave uh, since you are recording, uh, please don't shut down the Zoom so that- no, we can I will not. I, okay. I will just okay. uh, mute myself. And so that I can begin my work, return to it because I have a lot of stuff. So with that, uh, I will leave it on. Yes, it will be session will go on and recording will go on. Okay, I'll be here till till do 
you know, until the cows come home, as they say. All right. Well, um, thank you very much, Gene. And now informal, somebody should be, uh, uh, Mehmet or Ellen, are you willing to be the moderator for the rest I of I thought we didn't need a moderator for this section. Many of us think we do. Okay. If Ellen would do that, that'd be great. Okay, so within reasonable limits, you know, some people yeah. ramble on and on even more than the. Uh, I'm guilty of this myself. But they can always be interrupted or excused. Excuse me, can I say something? Kind of thing. I mean, we, it would be we, good we, if we, we, someone would take that responsibility. Well, individuals, if somebody comes along, I'm going to be dropping say, off. So just I'm gonna uh, be dropping have a conversation like you were living in your like you were in your living room. Um, okay. uh, Eugene, would you like to maybe lead uh, some uh, discussion too, so that uh, you may you may monitor it as well? Would would that be okay, Gene? Have a good evening, folks. I have to. Okay, but great, Musab, and I think you're doing something else at one o'clock, aren't you? Somebody is doing something on something that I found interesting, <laughs> but hopefully it'll be recorded. So, but have thank you, it's good have to good afternoon. and we'll see you next week for sure. So long, Yosef, so long, everybody. Okay, okay. And I'm gonna switch off myself and have a good session. Okay, so if people wanna stay on um, and make comments, uh, I guess we're here. Gary hasn't said anything. We have a lot of people who haven't said anything. And even, I don't know if, uh, if um, Rich is still there. So we can sit here for a half hour. <laughs> Anybody wants to take a lead? Well, I, I still think the question of um, the opening up is important and it needs to be addressed. Um, there was, a, um, uh, um, what was the, the theoretical justification for that? You know, it seems like it was a step back, and I think um, Raj raises, uh, raised an interesting point, and it needs to be answered. Um, I, I think he's incorrect. I think he's wrong about it. Um, but um, I think the, the, the answer to it in, in, in China and in Russia was that the the uh, working class was not fully capable of running society at that point, and they needed to be help fr from um, bourgeois forces uh, and the development that the that the that the um, nationalization of all the means of production um, uh, was premature in a way. I think uh, the the Stalin industrialization, I quote Stalin, I put that in quotation marks because it's, it's just a, a shorthand for the Soviet Union, was um, very important, but it could not be sustained. It was not sustainable in the way it was going and reached a crisis in the 80s. Um, there was a, a stagnation. And similarly in, in China. And um, to me, that's sounds, sounds, and the solution was taken to uh, incorporate some elements of capitalist development because the, the working class was not ready to do it itself, especially in the, in the context of uh, a development of imperialism, of capitalism, the whole capitalist world. The capitalist world continued to develop also. So it provided a more um, stronger opponent that, so um, uh, China stepped back um, a little bit and, uh, and, and an important way Russia did too. There was an attempt to restore capitalism in Russia, in the Soviet Union, and it uh, was beaten back. And I think the, the working class 
took, took power again, but also with a capitalist element. Um, so now we have two socialist countries, major socialist countries, China and Russia, linked to tightly together in an alliance, and it includes other countries also. Um, uh, but I, I think uh, Gene is correct that uh, this is a process that's going on. The socialist process is going on, and um, and, it, and, and, it, and it includes uh, up to a certain level uh, the law of value, the law, the exchange of commodities, the, the private accumulation of capital uh, in a um, dialectic with public ownership. But, um, you know, I'm not, I don't completely have it worked out in my head, but I think we need to do it. We need to understand that more fully. I think a lot of people are, uh, are confused about what's happening in China, what's up, especially what's happening in Russia um, also. So, uh, and it's had serious consequences, I think. Okay, you, you want, somebody else wants to talk, go ahead. And can Jin jump in real quickly? I want to have a question here. You know, because I think we all, you know, at the time we looked at China, you know, Mao's revolution, the communes, uh, every, you know, everybody was taken care of. We had the barefoot doctors. Uh, we had, uh, you know, everybody was working in industry and in, in um, our agriculture. And there's a unity there. Um, but, and, and we kind of idealized this, I think, and, and justly so. But the question is, would we want to live there or would we rather live in the United States where we have all this goodies here? I mean, and one of the things that I think you look at contemporary China, um, you know, they, they have, a, it's a consumer society. We say, oh, consumerism, that's bad. But, um, you know, we say that as, as we have our refrigerators and all our cars and everything else that we have here. So uh, I think it's, um, you know, Yes, China is, you know, Maoist China was in many ways provided a lot of ideals, but would you want to live there or would you rather live like in contemporary China or contemporary United States? And I mean, we may not like consumerism, but, uh, uh, you know, we all participate in it and we think we should be brought under control, but we don't know how to do that. But that's just my contribution. You have had something to hand up also. But you're asking that question of people who have the choice. I, I was thinking of in 1965, uh, my family and I uh, emigrated to Israel. We were gonna stay there forever and help build the socialist based nation. And we left nine and a half months later. My husband actually was ready to leave after a couple of weeks because he was more astute and perceptive than I was. In seeing what was going on it took me a while. Uh, and I also hadn't wanted to spend all that money and effort getting there and then immediately leave. So I stayed, you know, we stayed for that time. But uh, it was just so foreign, you know, and when we could come back to the United States, although we were very impoverished in a sense, I shouldn't use that word, I suppose, but we didn't have a lot of material, enough material access. Um, I did go back to school keep teaching as it were, although I got fired out of one job for letting one child talk about menstruation in class. She was uh, uh, sixth grade, I think. And uh, <clears throat> that was in Indiana. I lived in Chicago. Um, so uh, the the uh, change, the big change, you know, it's the same way that, um, I'll get his name in a minute, the fellow that wrote the book, uh, we, we just want to stay at home, you know, that about immigration, that people are charged with wanting to emigrate to the United States. No, they want to be able to stay home. Uh, what's the fellow who does those books, you know, uh, photographs of what's going on with immigrants and so on. Um, David Baker. Thank you. 
Uh, Maybe we move around and let some other people jump in because I think uh, nobody cannot jump in. Everybody can. Well, jump maybe in. you pause or let, let Yusuf talk for a while. Yeah. Because I think he has his hand up. And some other people haven't talked, been talking. Yeah, uh, make them talk. Take a baseball bat. So I think bat. we need to give, make some pauses and let uh, some of the other people who are present. And Yusuf had had his hand up. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, the justification uh, in, uh, under Gorbachev and uh, 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 under Deng Xiaoping was uh, a production, the, the necessity of, of production. And uh, although uh, they, they had made great strides and had re reached almost parity in conventional production, uh, in, in the uh, uh, capitalist countries uh, they entered into automation and computers and so on and so forth, and socialist countries were behind it. They were, uh, 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 capitalism wants to minimize uh, 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 labor uh, and uh, in the short, short term, uh, although it becomes its undoing in the long term. Uh, and 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 we moved at great cost, like under Thatcher and so on and so forth, uh, uh, to uh, automation, laying off people, uh, uh, so on and so forth, and that was a, a course that the socialist countries did not want to. Um, take they had scruples against it, and um, but they uh, were falling behind in production and uh, uh, well you have to um, as I said you can't have socialism without production uh, so uh, yeah and capitalism uh, either you order people to work more or, or maybe encourage them ideologically to work more or you uh, use a uh, a, a market mechanism to force them to, uh, 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 to produce more. So I, so I think that's what's, uh, I think that's the answer to the question. Uh, and and a, a, uh, my different, uh, I, I, I strongly disagree of characterizing the Russian Federation as socialists at all. I'm just, uh, under Putin, it has uh, stopped some uh, uh, of the more uh, 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 egregious of neoliberalism and kept some uh, uh, some uh, of the gains uh, of socialism, but it's uh, it's capitalist. So I would characterize the Russian Federation as socialist at all. Agree in the, I'm not being allowed to interject this comment. You don't agree with Gene that it, nevertheless, the Soviet Union, like many other places, are advancing in a socialist direction, a communist direction? No, there's no Soviet direction, Soviet Union. So uh, how could I? Well, I meant, I meant Russia. No, Russia is not uh, advancing in a socialist direction. No, uh, uh, under P P Putin and under the pr pressure from the uh, Communist Party, uh, some of the more egregious uh, uh, forms of neoliberalism have been uh, slowed down. But uh, I, I, that uh, a Russian Federation, uh, the present Russian Federation, I'm talking. The uh, tricolor flag uh, is not socialist at all. It's not. It's not a socialist country. Uh, it's, a, it's it's less uh, neoliberal than some other uh, countries. That's uh, true, but uh, it's not a socialist country. It has a strong communist party. Uh, so, but that doesn't make it socialist. It's a capitalist country. You know, there is, yeah, I think it's important to make a distinction, as you as you said, um, Russia, uh, post-Soviet Russia is not a socialist country, and I don't know how many vestiges 
of socialism remain, but it does have one of the largest communist parties in the world. And that has to have some impact, I think. And, um, you know, there's a nice thing that I quoted actually um, from Wikipedia, they have, have a list of socialist countries and they make the distinction. You have, there are some countries that, where the socialist party is a ruling party uh, like China uh, and Soviet Union. That, that's one, but there are other parties, other countries in which uh, there are socialist parties that are not, that are not ruling. There are some countries that have uh, socialism in their constitution such as uh, um, India does, but there's not a socialist country. Um, there are some parties that call themselves socialist. For example, the Labour Party in India, in, in um, England in the 1946, when they, or 45, when the Labour Party won the election, instituted national health care, nationalized countries, cities, and so forth. But it still wasn't, this, it, the, the ruling party was socialist called itself socialist, but um, the structure of the society was still capitalist, still, you know, uh, the, the political system was not yet socialist, but not a dictatorship of the proletariat, still a dictatorship of the capitalist class. So that, I think there are lots of little distinctions here we have to bear in mind. And, you know, when I say that socialism has benefited, um, humanity has been an important step forward. If you look at the actual um, what socialism has done, I, I think it's tr tremendously uh, contributed to the progressive development and well-being of our species. So I, I, I just want to make that, just, there's lots of different kinds of socialists, uh, some who have power, some who don't, uh, some who want power, some who don't. So anyway. Wow. Wow. Well, you know, I, think, I, think the, I think that there is a socialist mode, node in the world. There's two systems. There's two competing forces in the world. They're not. There's imperialism, which is a, a which is led by the United States, and which all the other imperialisms of necessity are subordinate to. And then the, there are the anti-imperialist forces, which are led by China, and which includes is a very important component. Russia, the Russian Federation. I think the, the, the underestimation of the importance of the Russian, Federa Russian Federation leads directly, leads inevitably to the um, underestimation of the importance of China. The, the alliance between Russia and China is crucial. It's particularly on the military area where China, Russia provides uh, basically a nuclear umbrella to both Russia and the other anti-imperialist countries. And um, uh, Russia is definitely, I, I think a, a major industrial country that is a capitalist is, has to be an imperialist country. It has to be uh, an exporter of capital uh, for the means and for the, for the objective of exploiting other countries. And I, I think both China and Russia are not imperialist countries. And I would include Belarus and Kazakhstan and Cuba and Vietnam and um, uh, Venezuela, and they're all tied together. There's, there's, a, there's a mutual aid there going on and um, mostly from the bigger countries to the smaller ones. Bolivia. Uh, Bolivia now, yes. Bolivia is back in the fold. Uh, Iran, you know, which, you know, is, is only peripherally a kind of socialist country, but Nicaragua. You know, because it's part of that block, it's, it's moving towards socialism with China, moving towards communism with China. I think you need to talk, I think people need to think about in a more dynamic way uh, than just, uh, you know, taking um, definitions from Lenin and Stalin. Or Thank Marx. you. Uh, well, I think, I think those, the, not because Lenin and 
or Stalin or, or, or Marx or Engels said them, but they, they, that they have re relevance. Uh, and, um, but they have to be looked at carefully, those definitions, and see how they uh, apply today. Um, uh, we can't just take them out, of, like, take a phrase out of context, and you know, some the conditions change. And anyway, yeah, well, we, well, well, I wouldn't characterize Russia as imperialist. Uh, the uh, Russian capitalism is at its, uh, I would say, at, as somebody who point, pointed out, actually was from the, uh, was born in Russia. Uh, uh, that uh, Russian capitalism is still at the in infancy. It hasn't exhausted all its uh, internal markets. It needs to export uh, in search, uh, go, uh, go into imperial predation. And, uh, uh, why, why, has, why has Russian capitalism broken with U.S. imperialism? Every other, imperial, other ca capitalist country looks to the United States for protection against its own working class. Uh, surely if the, if the Russian capitalist class wanted to retain, was able to retain power, they would turn to the United States for protection. Well, right now, it's, uh, first of all, not threatened with uh, a proletarian revolution. Number two, it's a-, a, a Of course it, it is. Of course it is. Or every country is threatened by a proletarian revolution. The working, especially in Russia, because Russia has a, a very developed working class, class conscious working class. I sort of I tend to agree, but well, we, well, it's, it's, it, well, first of all, it has its own interests. I mean, it doesn't want to be subsumed. Uh, the, the the faction of re Russian capital represented by Putin, as opposed to. Uh, Yeltsin uh, is a uh, is a national uh, a capital that uh, they put to have a had that has its own interest. That it's not. But that, the tone of the people is that they want to spread it everywhere. You know, they, they, they're, there's still a mass of people behind all of that. I may I say something to Richard? Uh, he asked a good question. Why don't they? Uh, why doesn't the Russian uh, capitalists are looking for protection from the United States? In, uh, you know, if this was 20, 30 years ago, they would, I think. And they have done this counter-revolution with the leadership and the help from the United States. But imperialism is at a stage where there is a, uh, you know, the, the top dog, the, the, the top capitalist imperialist country is in crisis. And that, uh, therefore, imperialism is in crisis. Normally, the countries that would be subsumed under the imperialism, the, uh, the uh, most developed ones, are now looking at to see if they can get to the table also, instead of sitting under the table. I mean, Turkey has no uh, even a chance to even have its uh, voice heard or, you know, any African country or Latin American countries, they don't. But when the top dog starts to falter, the most developed capitalist may be thinking, hey, here's a chance, uh, maybe not to become the top uh, imperialist, but at least to have a chance to sit at the table. I'm looking at Russia that way, and the Russian capitalists. Uh, uh, the, uh, the protection or to be the second dog is always there for the uh, not so powerful capitalists, and they know their interest. Their interest is to be uh, the, uh, you know, the, uh, let's say, slave to the top capitalists. So I think that uh, the, uh, the issue is not whether Russia or China is playing to be the top, but it's that the imperialism itself is in, uh, is in trouble, I think. What do you say? Uh, what, uh, uh, is that a question? Uh, is that a valid question to what you were saying? If it's uh, asked to me, I well, yeah, I I love the direction of your analysis. I don't. Maybe I might disagree, uh, and I think it's well worth saying. But uh, I mean, the uh, 
uh, the, 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 the capitalist, Russian capitalists represented by Putin uh, are the national capitalists. They, they, uh, they want their own, uh, they don't want to be subservient to imperialism. They're, they, they're looking after their own interests. But Yusuf, uh, uh, I would say that all capitalists have this at the back of their minds. But the reality is that uh, some, uh, you know, most of them cannot be. I mean, everybody wants to be the master of their own domain, but imperialism never gives them that chance. Right. So right. Why, why would then Russia be able to say, hey, wait a minute, we have a chance, but not Togo in Africa? Right, right. You know, even Germany doesn't consider itself, can't consider itself. Japan cannot consider. These are major capitalist countries where they have a consolidated capitalist class. They have the, where capitalism exists has existed for 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 centuries. But and, Richard, and they still they still demand protection from the United States. Uh, I, I think that is, Richard, I think that is changing. Look, uh, one of the important thing is that the European Union was set up by the United States. Yes. But today, European Union is forming its own armies. Why? So it's well, I think I think there's a, there, there is an effort. Okay. But, you know, this is an, an enormous capitalist block. They're attempting to form a capitalist block that is um, bigger than the United States. And at the same time, they want to be protected from their own working class. They have to be protected. Can't they protect themselves? Do you think they, they are unable to protect themselves from the, uh, work, their own working they class? They feel like it. You know, the United States is good at that. You know, the United States has an enormous military. But you know, so does... They uh, occupy Europe. They mm -hmm. occupy Japan. But look you at uh, France, what's going on there. And, uh, you know, uh, German police is well capable uh, to shut down any, you know, any uh, uprising, let's say, today. Uh, so I, I don't think that it, it used to... Uh, what was there before has changed. And I think it is time, uh, again, Germany is seeing itself as the leader of the Uni uh, European Union, and it is coming up as a block. I agree with you. But it comes at a point in history where imperialism, U U.S. imperialism is in trouble. Uh, I agree. Yeah. I agree. Okay. I agree. Well, uh, uh, comrades, uh, it is now one o'clock. I'm going to need to leave, and if I'm the host, that may end things, unless Mo Mehmet wants okay. to take over. Like, no, no, leave. that's that's good. Yeah, yeah I have to leave too. Right. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Interesting questions. We will continue next time. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And thank you very much, everybody. We, okay. we can criticize Raj next week. That, <laughs> we are all getting ready to. <laughs> okay. Outstanding. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Take Have care, everyone. And bye. Eugene, thank you very much. Good presentation. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. I really enjoyed this and got it off my chest, so I'll keep quiet for a couple months now. Institute for the Critical Study of Society at the Niebuhr Propter Marxist Library receives no corporate funding, nor do we have any paid staff. We rely on the support of working class folks that share our commitment to the socialist legacy of Karl Marx. We continue to need funds to meet necessary expenses. Since we can no longer pass the hat, at our in-person forums, please send contributions to our treasurer either online via PayPal or by check. The PayPal ID is ICSS Sunday S U N D A Y at yahoo.com, and the name is Richard Fallenbaum. And checks may be made out to Richard Fallenbaum and sent to him at 1225 Nielsen Street, Berkeley, California, 
94706. Fallenbaum is spelled F-A-L-L-E-N-B-A-U-M. To donate directly to the Marxist Library, send a check to the Nebro Proctor Marxist Library at 6501 Telegraph Avenue, Oakland, California, 94609, or di directly or donate online at www.paypal.me slash npml. Info for information, write to, to npml at marxistlibr.org and the website is marxistlibr.org.